Some royal mistresses knew they would be mere courtesans, while others tried to push as far as they could to be like the Queen. But a few actually managed to become the Queen. One of these royal mistresses who became a royal consort was Corinne Mon's daughter, who would also be a commoner who rose to be a queen. According to some sources, Corinne was born on the 6th of November 1550 in Stockholm to a soldier named Mons, who later became a prison guard, and his wife Ingrid. Ingrid's family had come from just north of Stockholm in Upland and were peasants. Ingrid herself made a living by selling vegetables on the market square. But by 1560, both of Corinne's parents had died, leaving her an orphan at the young age of 10, selling nuts from the same square. By 1564, Corinne appears in records as a servant in the household of Gert Cantor, a court musician to the king, Eric XIV. Gert also owned a tavern and guest house, and it's likely Corin was a waitress there. While we don't know how, Eric's sister, Princess Elizabeth, spotted Corin and brought her into her own household as a maid by at least 1565. This is where Corin caught the eye of Eric, and he was apparently struck by her beauty. She was described as having long blonde hair and innocent-looking blue eyes, and she herself was calm and demure. Eric had been king for about four years by this point, upon the death of his father, Gustav I, in September 1560. On the surface, he seemed like an ideal monarch, handsome, intelligent, cultured, and politically ambitious. But he had also shown early signs of insanity. Against his father's wishes, Eric had tried to negotiate for marriage to Elizabeth I of England, Mary, Queen of Scots, Renata of Lorraine, Anna of Saxony, and Christine of Hesse, all to no avail. As Elizabeth I was happy to keep Eric hanging on for a number of years in order to keep her own government and Privy Council hopeful, it also meant Eric was unable to seriously look for another wife while there was the possibility of unite crowns. However, he did have a huge number of mistresses, and Corin was soon added to them. Her position was made as official as possible at the court, considering there wasn't a proper position of royal mistress, and Corin was very quickly given her own apartment, wardrobe and household, as well as appearing publicly by Eric's side. Ironically, one member of her new staff was her previous employer's wife, Corinne, the wife of Gert Cantor. Not only that, but Eric almost immediately dismissed all of his other mistresses and ensured that Corinne was given an education. The new king showered Corinne with gifts, and their courtship was such a whirlwind that people whispered witchcraft had to be at work. When Eric went on campaign to Skara in 1565, Corinne accompanied him, and was even given funds to live on from the bailiff's provision for the army. It wouldn't be long before Corinne was expecting her first child, who would be born in Swatwer Castle a palace on Farangsa Island just outside of Stockholm. She was a girl named Sigrid, born on the 15th of October, and was treated as though she was a legitimate princess right from the start and given a household of her own. But despite this seemingly cosy family setup, cracks were about to start showing. Before meeting Eric, Corin had apparently been engaged to a man called Maximilian, who was an ensign in the army. When he discovered what had happened to his fiancée, he broke into the palace in an attempt to speak with her or possibly even steal her away. Unfortunately for Maximilian, he was discovered by the king's manservant, and when he was brought before Eric, he ordered him killed. Another version of the tale included Maximilian being tricked into entering the palace by Corin at the behest of Eric, the king trapping him and killing him that way instead. Some years earlier in 1561, 
Eric's council had agreed he could marry whoever he pleased, and by early 1567, Eric had decided he was going to marry Karin. Obviously, for most of his courtiers, the decision was controversial. Corin might have been a likeable person and the king's family thought she was very good for him as she was the only one able to calm Eric down from his periods of mental instability. But she was still a commoner and by becoming Eric's wife, this also meant she would become queen, which was something of an issue considering she was not likely to have understood much of the tasks expected of her, even if she was in fact lower gentry. Nevertheless, there were some that supported Eric's decision. His advisor, Joran Pershon, who also happened to be the head of the king's network of spies, was one of those who agreed with the choice. Many distrusted Joran, who was viewed as having too much power over the king, and he knew he had to keep his own position safe. Negotiations with foreign princesses or queens had failed, and the idea of a homegrown noblewoman becoming queen was too dangerous for Joran's position. Anna Anders' daughter, Pershan's wife, also became a close friend of Corin's. A few years earlier, in the early part of Eric's reign, he became suspicious of many of his nobles, replacing them with trusted commoners. As he often went away on campaign, Pershon was essentially left in charge, replacing the Privy Council. The King and Pershon used their respective positions and the lowered status of many of the nobles to enforce war-related financial demands on them, or worse, to torture them for information on those planning treason against the King. At this time in Sweden, torture could only be carried out on someone who had been sentenced with execution. So, many nobles were given the death sentence in order to be tortured, and their sentence would then be reduced afterwards. It's not difficult to see why some of the nobility might have thought about rebelling against their king, and Eric grew ever more paranoid, driven also by his mental instability. The king became especially insecure about Niels Svantesen Sture, a Swedish diplomat and nobleman. By 1566, Eric was pushed over the edge by his madness, the stress of war, paranoia towards those around him, and the pressures to provide an heir for his throne. And he pressed these fears into one person, Nils Sture. Nils was sentenced to death and tortured, but his sentence was commuted to being pulled through the streets of Stockholm in July, wearing a crown of straw, still bleeding from wounds inflicted on him by the torture. He was then sent to negotiate marriage with Renata of Lorraine, but by this point, Eric didn't really have any interest in really marrying her, having already met Corin. In the same month, Nils' supporters and family met at what they said was only a farewell party for their kinsman before he went to Lorraine. But others whispered, it was in fact a secret gathering to plan revenge. Eric already feared the Sture family were out to get his throne, and in January 1567, he had his page, Gustav Ribbing, arrested for desertion and sentenced to death in order to torture him for information. Under torture, the most dubious of all ways to get information, Gustav implicated Svante Sture, Nils' father, Per Breuer, Gustav Olsen Stenbock, and Sten Eriksson in planning to derail the king's wedding plans to Corin. Svante and Sten Eriksson were made to sign a document admitting to this, whether real or not, and agreeing they would not stand in the way of the marriage. Little did they know, evidence was still being gathered on them, and Eric called a Riksta, a meeting of the Swedish estates, or parliament essentially, for May 1567. On their way to the Riksta, those who had met at Stockholm in July 1566 were invited by the king to Swatwer Castle. The invitations were innocent enough, but on arrival, the nobles involved were arrested and told they would be tried before the High Court. Then came the news that the Riksdag was postponed until the 18th of May, 
and would deal with a conspiracy against the king that had been uncovered. And the remaining nobles who had been invited to the castle politely declined and didn't go. The trial was full of witnesses who had apparently heard conversations implicating the nobles in planning to kill the king and take his crown. Eventually, all of the nobles on trial were sentenced to execution and were taken to Uppsala Castle. But Corin would also be connected to the trial. Marta Sture, the wife of Svante Sture, travelled to Svatwa with her daughter Anna and asked to speak with the king. She was refused entry and instead placed under guard in the village, so she changed tack. Marta sent an appeal to one of Eric's illegitimate daughters, Virginia Eric's daughter, and also to Corin herself. When the prisoners were transferred to Uppsala, Marta and her daughter were also taken there and placed under house arrest. Eric arrived on the 16th of May, apparently in the middle of an unstable episode. The Riksdag had assembled, but with only a fraction of the nobles expected, and on the 19th, when the death sentences were supposed to be agreed upon, the king collapsed after losing his notes for a speech. On the 21st, Nils Sture returned from Lorraine and was immediately arrested, being refused an audience with the king by Persson. However, by the following day, Eric seemed to have had a complete change of heart. While they remained under arrest, Svante received a letter from the king, promising the charges of treason would be dropped and they would soon be reconciled. Marta once again took the opportunity to appeal to Karin, who had travelled to Uppsala with Eric. By this time, Karin was also pregnant again with her second child. Marta pleaded for her husband's life, and Karin willingly spoke to Eric about the matter. On the morning of the 24th of May, Karin sent for Marta, meeting her inside the castle and assuring her that Eric had agreed he would not hurt or execute his prisoners. Later that same day, the king, taking Persson with him, went to see Svante in his cell. Eric dropped to his knees before the prisoner, begging forgiveness and admitting he had wrongfully imprisoned him. He then left the castle, but stories differ as to whether he first spoke with Persson or was approached by an officer named Patris Caroli, who informed him Eric's brother John had apparently started a rebellion. But the insanity of the king was to come full four, as a few hours later Eric returned to the castle, entered the cell of Nil Sture and stabbed him. He then went back to Svante on his knees, regretfully telling him that he had now decided Svante would never forgive him, and so he had to kill him. The guards then attacked the prisoners, leaving only Sten Banir and Sten Eriksson alive after the king told them to keep Herr Sten free from harm and they weren't sure which one. As Eric left the castle, his tutor, Dionysus Berus, attempted to calm him, but the king ordered him killed as well before running off alone into the nearby woods. The killings were not even made immediately public and the prisoners' families continued to bring food for them to the gates of the castle. Corin joined in the search for the missing king and he was eventually found a few days later on the 27th in the village of Odensala, dressed as a peasant and still in the grip of insanity. A day earlier, Pershon had succeeded in obtaining a decree from the Riksdag for all past and future sentences against the detained nobles in Uppsala. It's unlikely those at the Riksdag actually knew they were already dead. Eric was brought back to the capital, but his courtiers feared going near him in case he exhibited more madness and tried to, you know, stab one of them. The only people allowed near him were Corin, who seemed to calm him somewhat, and the Dowager Queen Katharina Stenbock, Eric's stepmother. She was also related to many of the victims of the Sture murders, but when she entered Eric's chambers, he reportedly got down on his knees and begged forgiveness for his actions. 
He asked her to negotiate a settlement between himself and the families. This would include letters of protection for the families, financial compensation, a public announcement that the victims were in fact innocent, and that those who had pushed the king down this path be punished. In short, that Pershon be arrested and sentenced to death. Eric agreed, although Pershon's sentence would later be revoked when Eric regained control of his mind and took back power. In December 1567, he finally married Corin in a secret ceremony. Few were impressed with the marriage, even if they had agreed not to prevent it. The idea that the king could fall in love with and then marry an uneducated commoner meant Corin was viewed with suspicion of having used witchcraft again. However, it may have been Corin's very status as a commoner that made her even more attractive to the paranoid Eric. Even though he may well have actually been in love with her, Corin's lack of connections, family interests or political leanings meant she could be trusted. She was also dependent on the king, and that would probably have made her easier to control. On the 4th of July 1568 in Storshikan, an official marriage was arranged, along with Corin's coronation, under the name Katerina Magnus Dorte, a more formal version of her name, the next day. It's obvious Corin herself knew her position was not taken seriously by her new relatives, shown by a letter she sent to her new sisters-in-law, Princesses Sophia and Elizabeth, referring to herself as Chosen Queen, rather than simply Queen. This has been interpreted that she understood her role was not fully accepted. Apparently, Eric had also had plans to have his brothers and other enemies bumped off before the wedding, but thankfully didn't follow through on the plan. However, the absence of these people from the ceremony was noted. The wedding was also unusual, however, for being the only royal Swedish wedding at the time where children of the couple were also present. Their infant son Gustav was also pronounced Prince Royal. Corin proved herself to be a generous queen, making gifts of patronage to religious institutions, as well as granting estates to her friends and relatives. But her tenure as queen would be short, as in the autumn of 1568, the nobility finally rebelled, led by Eric's brother Johann. The king put up some resistance, but was ultimately imprisoned by Johann, who assumed power for himself on the 30th of September. Much of the blame for the king's actions was heaped on Joran Persson, who this time did not escape an execution. In January 1569, the Riksdag formally dethroned Eric and handed the reins of power to his brother, who became Johan III of Sweden. Corin was initially imprisoned with Eric at the Royal Palace of Stockholm, and their children were placed under the protection of Queen Dowager Katerina, although they would be reunited in 1570. The only known portrait of Corin also comes from this period, a sketch made by Eric himself while they were both imprisoned. Eric and Corin were moved around various castles over the next few years, and Corin also gave birth to two more children, one in 1570 and one in 1572, although both babies sadly died. On the 14th of June 1573, the couple were formally separated to prevent any more children being created. The grief and fear Eric felt at this is clear at what he wrote in his diary about the incident, simply stating, My wife has been taken from me by use of violence. Corin and her two children were taken to the castle of Turku in Finland, where she would remain for the next four years until Eric's death on the 26th of February 1577. Three plots had been attempted in the eight years of Eric's imprisonment, and finally his brother Johann signed a document stating that if anyone tried to free him, his guards were to kill Eric. According to tradition, 
the ex-king was given a poisoned bowl of pea soup as his last meal. Modern forensic analysis on his remains revealed that he had indeed died of arsenic poisoning. What Corin's reaction was to her husband's death is unknown, but she does seem to have genuinely loved him. After his death, she was treated with kindness, being given the royal estate Luxiala Manor in Kangasala, Finland, where she would remain for the rest of her life. She would only return to Sweden on two occasions, once in 1577 to ask at court for financial assistance, and in 1582 at Zvatwer Castle to meet with Queen Catherine Hjagelon and Queen Dowager Katerina. Corin was well liked and respected in Finland, and her estate became wealthy under her care of it. Her daughter Sigrid, who was allowed to remain with her, became a lady-in-waiting to Johann's daughter, Princess Anna, later marrying twice to noblemen. But Corin's son Gustav had been taken from her in 1575 and sent to Poland to a Jesuit monastery. They finally met once again in Estonia in 1595, but he was now Catholic, couldn't remember his mother and had forgotten how to speak Swedish which unfortunately was Corin's only language. She identified him by his birthmarks, but he was now a poor peasant. Corin attempted to help him financially and petitioned the court for his return to Sweden, but it was never given. On the 13th of September 1612, at the age of 61, Corin died after an illness at Luxiala Manor. She was buried with some ceremony at the Cathedral of Turku, her tomb topped with a small golden coronet to signify her royal status. Corin was one of a handful of commoners who became queens, and she exerted her influence over Eric not with politics or family, but through her kind nature and ability to bring him back from the brink of madness. Her marriage to the Swedish king may have been the catalyst for his dethronement, but she herself was always regarded with kindness and not suspicion, barring a few whispers of witchcraft. Corin Monsdottir was not an ambitious, ruthless queen, but her part in history is still felt, and despite her relationship being far from ideal, her story is also probably as close as real life could get to a real-life Cinderella story. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss any new documentaries.